Welcome, dear friends. My name is Daniela. I welcome you on behalf of 2025 Initiative. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, Alexander, to you. Thank you, Daniela, and uh, greetings to everyone. We work with the energies of the Leo full moon and in this potent time, through all five days of the full moon period, we invite us to focus on the topic of co-creating and cooperating with emerging mysteries of our time. This presentation today is opening our work for the next few days, inviting you to a beautiful part of our gardening symbolism to the bee land. Thank you for being with us today. Over to you, Daniela. So our presenter and guide today is Zahra Indigo Rolov who will speak about ancient Egypt, bees, and interconnectedness. But before we go into the presentation, let us first do a short alignment. Let us close our eyes, and to somewhat paraphrase Rumi, let us step out of the circle of time and enter into the circle of love. Standing in the circle, let us connect with each other, heart to heart, mind to mind, soul to soul, creating this beautiful circle of light and love. A circle of love, a sphere of love, Bathed in the light of our group soul. Let us bring our awareness to the great chain of blessings that are coming our way these days. From Sirius, the star of initiation, into Leo, the energies go through his heart to and through the heart of our sun to and through the teacher of men and angels alike to and through the spiritual hierarchy through the heart of our group through the heart of the humanity and through us flowing into the heart of the earth and all her inhabitants. As the energy flow returns from our planet's heart into our group, blessing us in her own way let us voice together the affirmation of the disciple. We are a point of light within the greater light. We are a strand of loving energy within the stream of love divine. We are a point of sacrificial fire focused within the fiery will of God and thus we stand. We are a way by which men may achieve. We are a source of strength enabling them to stand. We are a beam of light shining upon their way. And thus we stand. 
and standing thus, revolve and tread this way the ways of men and know the way of God. And thus we stand. Thank you. Standing thus, now I turn the feather of speech to Zahra. Zahra, it's your, no, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to be with you today. Um, and all of those who have joined us, thank you for joining us. Um, the intentions for our time together today are um, the alignment, which Daniela just offered to us so beautifully. And I'm going to introduce myself a little bit and what we're doing today. I will speak about the bees and ancient Egyptians. I'll talk into the importance of bees on our planet and for our lives. And then we'll end with a guided journey um, through an experience that aims to connect our to our global hive mind. And this will be a planetary healing that we'll do not only in the moment, but also how we carry forth in the next many days and weeks ahead. So. Maybe at this point uh, would be good to remind that uh, while we going through this journey, please prepare uh, a little honey for the ending ceremony. And if you have a bee wax candle. Yes. And if you have the candle with you sooner than the end, I think it might be lovely um, if we light it sooner. So just gather that uh, if you don't have it next to you. And if you don't have that, it's fine. We have that in our kind of esoteric, etheric realm. We all have candles burning and we can light them that way. So I just want to begin the video. I have some video and it might come in a little choppy, but that's okay. The essence of it is here. So this says, her fuzzy body round as a ball. Her dainty wings seem much too small to zip or zoom or fly at all. And yet she still does. Beautiful bumblebee. So my name is Zahra Indigo and I live in Eugene, Oregon on the west coast of America. Um, I live on a blueberry farm, an organic blueberry farm, and this farm has been offering blueberries to the bees in the world for, um, gosh, 70 years or something like that. And it's been in my family for about 30 of those years. So um, though I am not a beekeeper, specifically myself, we have beehives on our farm and I want to let you all know that I am not an expert in bees by any means, but I love bees. And I am um, perhaps not an expert, but a deep student of the Egyptian mysteries. And I'm bringing that to you today, the, the connection between the bees and the mysteries and, and ourselves and our lives. Um, I hold a degree, a master's degree in eco-psychology from Naropa University. And eco-psychology is a field of psychology that comes out of transpersonal psychology, which comes out of humanistic psychology. And it essentially is um, looking at the human being and the, is the nexus of ecology, you know, the, the natural world, psychology, who we are, and spirituality. And when those three are in balance, um, we have a, a healthy whole human being. And if we have many healthy whole human beings, we have a healthy whole ecos, ecosystem. So um, that's my my schooling. Uh, I have a teaching certificate from the Waldorf Institute of Southern California and have been steeped in anthroposophy and um, all that comes from Rudolf Steiner's uh, teachings, though I um, am not teaching in that system at this point in my life. I still am infused with that from my learning. 
Uh, I am a practitioner and teacher of the Egyptian mysteries and a healing form called alchemical healing. And um, what we're doing today is very much the Egyptian mysteries because as you see, I have a, a slideshow for you and we're going to move through the slideshow, but part of the mysteries is arriving fully and completely into this moment and taking all the planning, all the whatever we wanted this moment to be with us, but also then letting it go and allowing what spirit has to tell us, has to show us, however it has to guide us. So um, that's that's how I work and how we'll move through today. And just briefly, I'm also a minister of prayer with the Center for Sacred Studies. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur and you know I'm already a farmer, a blueberry farmer, and I do lots of other things. Um, I'm a writer and artist, and perhaps most importantly, I'm a mom. I have two beautiful sons. So um, that's who I am. and the most important piece about what we're doing is this idea of restoration of the ancient mysteries because the ancient mysteries and the modern mysteries there's no separation um, between them and so we have this opportunity today to connect the past and the present to co-create the future with alignment to the natural systems of the earth and the cosmos that's really our goal, right? How do we pull what was into what is so that we can take all those, those threads of becoming to weave what will be in a way that benefits not just me, not just you, not just the bees, but those who will be here five years from now, 20 years from now, 100 years from now, 5,000 years from now, as the monuments in Egypt tell us, you know, there may very well, hopefully, prayerfully be people in a time so long from now. So what are we doing today to lay the ground, lay the the healing for this planet and for them? Um, we'll work with archetypal principles today um, of the ancient Egyptians, but those because they're archetypal principles, although the, I'm speaking from the ancient Egyptian kind of languaging, um, those principles are, they're universal, right? And so I may be talking about Sekhmet as a lion, but her fierce compassion can be found all over the world and traditions all over the world. So as you're listening to my words, you can listen to behind them to what the essence of of those archetypes are um, and how they're mirrored through you, through the natural world, and again, to use that to help weave into, into the future. Um, one of the other pieces that for me is foundational that we'll touch on a little more as we go deeply, more deeply today, is um, this idea of taking what we learn, how we grow, how we begin to connect with one another and use that to build our foundation of truth. And in the ancient times, that was called ma'at. And we'll talk more about ma'at um, coming up. But that's that foundation of truth, of cosmic law, um, of, of natural principles, right? How do, we, how do we stand in that place? Um, the other piece is this idea of the power of ritual and the very act of joining together today and, and the beautiful alignment that Daniela led, that's a ritual, right? That's a, a communal ritual that that you have on a on a regular basis, this group has on a regular basis. You know, there's habitual rituals like brushing our teeth, for example. Um, there's personal rituals such as meditation and, and prayer. Um, and then I think about the bees and they have rituals, right? They, they, the honeybees have a beautiful dance that they do um, to convey how to get to the really juicy, yummy flowers out there. And so, you know, they'll come in off the fields and they'll do this little jig, little, little ritualistic dance that communicates then to the others what to do. So the natural world also has ritual um, in different ways than perhaps we do, but ritual all the same. So I think now this idea of ritual and, and we all have this beautiful candle and if you don't have the candle you can see the flame on the screen. Um, I think now instead of the end, I thought we would do it at the end, but I think um, beginning our time together um, lighting the flame, lighting the fire um, of this beautiful beeswax that the bees have offered us with all their hard work and the flame representing our heart 
our life pulse. And as all of our flames light up together, we create a beautiful beam of light out to the cosmos saying we're here, we're connected. And just take a minute to allow that flame to take hold, knowing that as we move through our time together today, it will be burning bright. So why bees? Why bees? I know that you've been working on this initiative of the garden, planting the garden this year. And bees are essential because they're one of the most important beings on the earth. They are busy pollinating and helping the world become since the beginning of time, since the first bee crawled out of that first honeycomb. And I guess it's sort of like the chicken and the egg, which came first, the honeycomb or the, the bee. <laughs> but they're so important. Their honey sweetens and it heals. And today, in these modern times, they face many human created obstacles, but I believe that our collective care and awareness really can help them. There's so much we can learn from their ability to work together for the benefit of the whole. And this bee here um, is, I should honor where these guys came from, or these, it's the females that are the worker bees out flying, getting the pollen. So she is um, a bee in Essex, England. So this is a, an English bee. And the hunt, uh, bumblebee up here, this is at my blueberry farm on a blueberry flower. <laughs> So the ancient Egyptians have a very important role in the world of bees and beekeeping. Humans have harvested wild honey since time forgotten, but the first cultivated beehives are traced back to Egypt's old kingdom. And here in this picture, you can see the beehives and all the bees. Um, and the person with his hands up, you'll see that uh, kind of gesture a lot in the Egyptian hieroglyphic um, carvings of, it's almost like honoring or offering gratitude, offering energy. It's almost like Reiki. Um, there's a lot of different thoughts about that, but this reverence for the bees. Uh, and I just wanna point out that if you see a little circle down here with a little arrow, that means that I pulled the picture from somewhere else and I have references at the end to honor everywhere else it came but if the pictures don't have that um, they were taken by me so just to know that um, and the bee hieroglyph is an ideogram and it means bee right so if you see it on the walls it means bee and it can be found carved on the temples throughout Egypt to this day um, the bee's importance in Egyptian life is evident by its use in the title for king of Lower Egypt. This one up here contains the title for the king. So there's the bee and there's a sledge there. Um, and I'm not sure why this is. I couldn't find a direct reason why the bee was a part of the title, but I pondered on it. And I think it's because the honey had such great value in all aspects of Egyptian life and in the running of a Ma'atian civilization, which is what they, all aspects of the Pharaoh's world was to um, serve Ma'at. Ma'at is the ultimate archetypal aspect of truth with a capital T, meaning that greater truth, not like my own little truth, but all the truth, justice, harmony, and natural law and order. She, Ma'at, is the found, or it, it, she, I'll get into that, is the foundational principle of ancient Egypt. So over here in this photo, you can see this is um, the Pharaoh Seti, and he has received Ma'at, he's caring for Ma'at, and he returns Ma'at. And that's the whole rule of the Pharaoh, is to care for truth, justice, harmony, natural law, and order. And in turn, the people would be born into the world knowing that they were born to serve Ma'at, to serve natural order. Um, at some point along the way, Ma'at went from pure uh, concept to 
a goddess. She was anthropomorphized into a goddess. And the stories are that she's the daughter of Ray. And so the Maatian connection to bees comes through the fact that bees are all about natural law and order. Their, their society, bee society, is very Maatian, very much in, um, they all act for the greater good of the whole, of the colony, right? And they're also connected through Ray because Maat was the goddess or the daughter of, of Ray. And it is said that the god Ray wept and the tears from his eyes fell on the ground and turned into a bee. The bee made his honeycomb and busied himself with the flowers of every plant so that wax was made and also honey out of the tears of Ray. And so Ma'at was born of Ray and the bees too were born of Ray. I didn't have a picture of Ray, him, the, the way he's portrayed in the hieroglyphic um, hieroglyphics, but I wanted to show him here and his splendor um, rising up in the morning. Um, this is at Philae, the Temple of Philae, dedicated to the goddess Isis, and above these are, of course, the Great Pyramids in Giza, so honoring the, the fiery essence of Ray in that way. So Sekhmet is considered the feminine face of the sun. And this connects her both to Ma'at as a daughter of Ray and to the bees who are born from the tears of Ray. Sekhmet is a fierce warrior of Ma'at and she's also a compassionate healer. You can see her here in this picture um, behind her beloved Ptah. He's a creator god who speaks things into existence. Um, but not, this isn't about Ptah, we like you Ptah, but this is about Miss Sekhmet. And you can see she's got again that um, pose of energy of healing um, behind him there. In her mythos, uh, the humans on the planet were not being good humans. They were being insolent and not treating the world with care, um, not following the natural order and laws of the universe of Ma'at. And so Sekhmet was sent down to help them um, stop this bad behavior, but instead she became so enraged that she flew into a bloodbath of killing and, and whatnot. It wasn't so great. Um, and they went, uh-oh, <laughs> that's not quite what we meant, Sekhmet. It's a little over the top. Uh, and so they made a brew to calm her down. And this beer was made of honey and pomegranate to turn it red. And she would think it was a blood and she'd lap it up. And in that, um, some of the stories say she fell into a stupor, but more than that, I believe that she just remembered her heart. She remembered her compassion. She took a breath and a pause to see that she had taken it a bit too far. And so in that place of compassion and of love, um, she then went back to heal. So she became the compassionate healer, the fierce compassionate healer. And because honey in the ancient time was not only used to sweeten, but also used as medicine, I can just see Sekma out there in the field, you know, helping the injured from her, um, her choices, her, her slashing and rage, and applying the honey onto the wounds to keep them from getting infected and to help them heal well, and honey into the mouth to give them some energy to get through that healing. So, um, again, the bees are, are integral to all of this. Sekhmet had a child with Ptah, and their child, his name is Nefertem. He is the blue lotus, and he represents the awakened one. And here in this picture, this is a, a blue lotus that was I took at the um, Egyptian Museum in Cairo. They had a pond out front with with blue lotus in it and amazingly enough I got it right when a little bee was coming by so um, you can see where the hieroglyph let me pop back up there the hieroglyph of the bee is really truly styled after um, what their Egyptian bee counterpart looks like the blue lotus itself was a very important sacred plant used in ritual in Egypt for um, various ceremonies uh, and it's 
connection to the bee is pretty evident. The bee would fly around to all those lotus ponds collecting the pollen and um, spreading that, that love, that bee love. So as we've been talking about, bees and their importance permeated all aspects of Egyptian life. And these ancient peoples used honey and wax for food and healing. It was also used in mummification, it was used for currency and in offerings to the gods. It, ancient honey has been found thousands and thousands of years old that is still edible. Um, some was found in Tutankhamun's tomb when that was opened as well as some other places. There's a very important ancient ceremony that's called the opening of the mouth. And honey would be placed into the mouth of or to the mouth of a statue of a god or a mummy and um, or other great ones. And what this would do is when the honey would enter into the mouth place, into that, that place of receiving, um, it would awaken the divinity within. So again, honey being the awakener, just as Nefertam is the awakened one, honey is the awakener to become that. And there was a, a piece that came from a papyrus that says, that says, Hail Amun-Ra, Lord of the throne of the two lands, I present unto thee honey. I love seeing this picture with all the bees and all the, the perfect honeycomb. It's just so symmetrical and amazing. So I've been talking a lot here for a bit um, and I would just love to hear from anybody that has to share about what might be invoked within you as you ponder the depth of time that humans have been dependent upon bees or any questions or thoughts that you might have. So please, if there's something you would like to share, it's not just about me, but about all of us and what we have to offer. You can raise your hand. I guess everybody knows how to do that by now or just post a question into the question section. There is one raised hand in it. Zara, this is Daisha in Victoria, British Columbia. Hello. And this has been such a beautiful reminder of our connection. I think any of us who have gardens watch the bees with great gratitude as they work so hard. Yes. And I think at this point in your presentation is the perfect moment for us to taste the honey that we hopefully all have in front of us. Oh, oh, just just wait, I have a plan. Oh, you've got a plan. Okay, great. <laughs> so, great gratitude for everything you've brought to us this morning. It's oh, you're so just welcome. a beautiful presentation. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Does anybody else have any thoughts or questions or ponderings about Egypt and bees? And there's more to come, so there's always a chance to share later. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can continue then. All there right. was just one raised hand right now and then it disappeared, I guess. Yeah. Well, there'll be other chances for sharing for sure in just a little bit as well. So if you have some thoughts, um, hold on to them and we will gather them up in just a few minutes. So importance on Earth, bees importance on Earth specifically. All the creatures of the Earth owe a great deal of gratitude and appreciation to the humble bee for without their tireless service, the planet would be very, very different. And I, I chose of all the photos I could found uh, of the Earth, I chose this one because it's centered there with 
Egypt, so beautiful. You can even see the lotus of the Nile, the way the, the river goes up as the stem and then it blossoms there at the Mediterranean. The keeping of bees is like the direction of sunbeams, says Henry David Thoreau. And isn't that the truth? It's like gathering sunlight. The bee is domesticated, but not tamed, says William Longgood. And these are my bees from my farm here coming to the water hole. I love there just towards the end when the sunlight hits their bodies and you can see the honey. It's almost like they're just little beings of honey, little bubbles of honey flying around, um, bubbles of sweetness. Helping our whole world. There are approximately 20,000 varieties of bees in the world, and the honeybee being only one of them. We're very used to this black and yellow honeybee designation, but honeybees also come in very many other colors and also many sizes, from itty bitty to quite large. Honeybees specifically are studied a lot because of their importance in pollination. Um, for crops and such across the world. And it's been shown that they pollinate around 70 of the world's 100 crop species that feed 90% of the world. They're responsible for $30 billion a year in crops, right? That's just amazing. And their value is estimated at 20 times the value of the honey they produce. 20 times. So their, you, their uh, I don't like the word use, but their benefit is so huge in everything we do to live as humans, all the crops that we depend on. Um, the honeybee helps us have those crops. It takes one colony of honeybees, around 30,000 individuals, to pollinate an acre of fruit trees. Pollination success, of course, increases if there are more honeybees present at the time of peak flowering. And so for us here at my farm, for example, we bring in, we have honeybees that live here all year, but also in the spring, we bring in additional hives to help make sure that the six acres of blueberries um, all get the pollination that they require. In her entire life, a worker bee gathers 0.8 grams of honey. And it requires approximately 556 flying, the equivalent of once around the world, to gather a pound of honey. And to make a pound of honey requires millions and millions of flowers. So a pound of honey is not very much <laughs> in the scheme of all the honey that there is. And so then multiply that pound of honey times all the honey that there is, and then how many flowers and how many how how far each of those worker bees flew to make all that happen. It's, it's almost mind boggling, really. So every worker bee goes through a progression of jobs, the same progression. And there are, there's the queen bee, and then there's drone bees, and the drone bees are the males, and then there's the worker bees, and the worker bees are females. And the worker bees are housekeepers to begin with. And then they're undertakers, taking care of the dead. And then they're, they're, they work in the nursery, caring for the, the baby bees. And then they attend to the queen. And once they've done all those things, then they get to go to the job of collecting nectar for the hives. So they, they have an order in their life. And everyone, just like in the ancient times, the children would be born into the world knowing they served ma'at. The bees know that they serve the hive and the order of the hive. Without bees, we may lose all the plants that bees pollinate, or at least to a great degree. And it's not just the plants that they pollinate, but it's, and it's not just our dependence on those plants, but it's also all the animals 
and other beings in the world who rely on that. And so without bees, the entire food chain begins to break down. And so that's a pretty, pretty, um, gosh, it's, it's super important, right? That we care for our bees as if they are our own family, because in fact they are, they are our family as all creatures of this earth are all family. So, um, Another quick moment before we go into our experiential time together um, of sharing, I would love to hear again if you know anything of bees or have any bee facts that you would like to share with us. Um, we create this together, so hearing from you is really lovely. You can raise your hand or put your question in the question box if you have anything to share. And if not, we will continue on. There were a couple of comments posted during uh, the first part, and so I will read them from, for, for you and for everybody. There is one comment from Mitch who says that the counterpoint of the bee in the unified kingdom was the reed, rich in DMT. Right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I then guess from... that was uh, Miss Palin, probably that was weed. I don't know. Ah, weed, maybe, yes. <laughs> yes. Then from um, Riza, we are taught that the that we are taught the bees came from Venus, from sorry, from Venus with Sanat Kumara. And she continues to say to teach humanity how to live in community. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. From Yvette, um, she's saying, I'm grateful for the presentation. Beautiful. Well, and one of the things that I we went from this ancient Egyptian time, right? It was so long ago, the, the old kingdom was over 5,000 years ago, um, to the importance today. And one of the things that's very important is that all traditions, no matter where you look on the globe, you're going to find a connection to the bees and their significance, not only physically in the physical daily life of people, but also spiritually, right? So, um, so Riza, thank you for bringing that in, that they are, they their importance permeates all of humanity through all of time, through all of traditions. And you can find access points to them from all the traditions. And Egypt being just really the first of, of domesticating or ra rather uh, beekeeping, you know, providing a place for them and taking advantage of, of that by harvesting the honey and the wax. Okay. So. I know this is a little tricky to read, um, so I'll read it out. It says, this is from Rudolf Steiner. And um, Rudolf Steiner was a the, the founder of biodynamic farming. Um, many of you may know about what that is. Um, and so he was very keyed in on the the land and how things grow and the spiritual significance of that as well. Um, and he said, indeed, one can only arrive at the right understanding of what the life of the bee truly is when one takes into account that the whole environment of the earth has a very great influence upon the life of the colony. This life within the hive rests upon the fact that the bees work so completely together so arranging their whole activity that everything is in harmony. And so that's ma'at right there, right? That So everything is in harmony. So everyone knows their role so that they can all do the work that they are here to do. Um, I see the question from Darcy, what is the drone function of the male bees? And um, they are to serve the queen, basically. They're help to help uh, fertilize the eggs um, and, and such. So they, they are to serve the queen and, and to help make more bees. 
And Helen says, in addition to planting flowers for bees, it's important to supply water too. Indeed, indeed, indeed. So here I have another little video. This is one of the hives at my farm. And I don't know if the quality is coming good enough into each of you, but you can see some of them, their wings are still and they're resting. This is a very hot day, which is why they're all outside the hive. But then there's many of them that are here in the opening that are continuing to, to flap their wings. It's because they're working to help keep the flow of air in and out of the hive moving. Oh, and this is my cat, sorry. I have to stop it before now, but we might as well see now. <laughs> um, so they're working together, all these bees, in a beautiful way. Oh, so we're going to go into an experiential process together. And um, I love this photo because it's we're going to be guided. And here's this beautiful bee, um, beautiful bee, uh, with the sunlight catching its tail end in that way. And we're in this place of the full moon of Leo. And the full moon of Leo, Leo being the lion, and lion being Sekhmet, and Sekhmet being the feminine face of the sun, and the sun being the one who gave birth to the bees through the tears. Yeah, so we bring it all the way around to this place. And so as I guide us through this next piece, um, I ask that we all go together, being guided through my words, through my voice, and that we stay together as one, just as the hive would be together as one. And this is an interactive visualization, sorry, visualization, that word didn't roll off my tongue very easily, carried by the sound of my voice, as I said, the words you hear, and the sweetness of the honey that we're about to all eat together. And I'm gonna ask that you make a sound, mm, when prompted, okay? And as we all show up in the shared collective experience, guided by my voice and the words I say, also pay attention to what else becomes part of your individual knowing, however this experience moves with, through, in, and around you. Now we each receive information in different ways. Some people are very visual. Some people will hear my words and just know that that's what's going on, but they may not see it in their mind's eye. Um, some people feel some people sense, some people taste. Whatever it is for you, however it is you receive inner information in that inner way is correct and right and just pay attention to what's real for you, right? Okay, so we are going to now begin by picking up our jar of honey. And just before you even open it, Look at the color. Ponder all that it took for your jar of honey to be. All the flowers, all the bees. And then think about each of us who are here together on this webinar and all the honey that we hold in each of our hands. Right? And then all the honey that is right now on the planet in all the jars and all the beehives, all the honey in the past. So much honey, oh my goodness, so much honey. So go ahead and open the lid of your honey jar and take your spoon and dip it into the honey. Now, if you don't have a honey jar with you, you still have every ability to <clears throat> do this in your mind's eye seeing the drip of the honey in the picture, knowing the taste of the honey and the smell of the honey through your experience. Notice the way this golden thick <clears throat> liquid sticks to the spoon and drips back into the jar. And when the, jar, the drips are complete, go ahead and put your jar down. and bring the spoon to your nose. 
and breathe deeply the aroma and the sweetness. Mm -hmm. Allow the smell to bring to your mind's eye the hive. When you're ready, lift the spoon of honey slowly and gently into your mouth and onto your tongue. Allowing the honey to enlighten your taste buds with sunlight mm. and the flower mm. and life. And as this honey drips around your tongue and down your throat, I invite you to make this sound of pleasure. Mm. Just keep repeating that sound until the honey itself is no longer in your mouth and is all gone into your system. Mm. Allow the sweetness to awaken all of your senses. As you now bring your awareness into the hive, into the honeycomb, as you gaze onto this screen. Rumi says that your soul has become an invisible bee. We don't see it working, but it's there full honeycomb. And as you gaze into this honeycomb, allow your eyes to begin to close. Allow yourself to be surrounded by the honey within the comb, the honey that nourishes you, that gives you life. And within this place, within this cell of this comb, you notice activity around you and above you. And you feel the pull of sunlight calling you. And soon, you know, somehow, you know, in the depths of your being that you are ready. And you begin to crawl out of your cell and you notice all the others who are also now crawling out of their cells. You feel your wings begin to flap, begin to vibrate. You feel life pulsing through you, the life of the hive, and you know your place. And now just breathe deeply into this being of the bee. Breathe deeply into the heart of the bee, into the heart of the beehive. Notice what it feels like to be a part of the colony, to move through the roles that you hold, caretaker, nursery care, tending to the queen,
And soon the time comes for you to go and collect the pollen and you find yourself at the opening of the beehive with all the others who have worked their way through their roles to now be ready to fly. You notice the bees coming in from the fields and they relay to you the information through their dance of where you are to go. And once you receive your instructions, you take off and you fly, knowing which flowers to stop and which flowers to pass. Allow yourself to fly through this journey, through this important work, spreading the pollen from flower to flower, and in doing so, allowing the next generation of flowers to come for the next generation of bees yet to be. Notice the environment where the flowers are. Notice the sky and the sun. Notice the earth below. Notice the breeze gently blowing the flowers to and fro. And soon you know that it's time to head back to the hive, that you've gathered enough for this moment. And you follow the way you came back to the opening of the hive where other bees are waiting for your instruction. And you give them a little dance, telling them which of the flowers are good and which to avoid until another day. And those bees then fly off with the instruction you gave them and you enter back into the hive to bring what you have collected. all the healing power of all those flowers condensed into the honey. And now that honey collected from all the flowers from each of us is now in the honeycomb. When you're ready, open your eyes once again to look at the screen, to look at this honeycomb that holds the honey that each of us has created. And now take your jar of honey and hold it up to the screen. And know that all of the medicine, all of the flowers from all, <clears throat> all of the millions of flowers that we've collected together into this honeycomb on the screen now infuses our jars of honey.
and so that this jar of honey now holds medicine from the world. Medicine for the world. To soothe and heal. To bring energy and hope. When you're ready, take another little bit of this new honey, this world honey, into your mouth. Mm, allowing the sweetness and the healing mm, to permeate every cell and every molecule in your body. so that you can arrive and fully be here now as a part of this global colony, this global becoming, this global garden of health, of nourishment, of truth. Take a deep breath now into your heart center, carrying with you always that invisible bee And of course, after eating honey, it's fairly sticky. So it's important to clean ourselves up. I have no idea what they're saying. So if they're saying something inappropriate, I apologize. <laughs> this bee was an Egyptian bee on in Luxor and it had blown into my orange juice that morning and I had uh, fished or bead the bee out. I guess it's not fished, bead the bead out and it was getting the sticky juice off of it. <laughs> so I would love to hear from you what you noticed during your experience of becoming the bee and being a part of the beehive, being a part of the colony, of flying out to gather and bring back this importance. So tell me, what did you notice? And you can raise your hand or type in the chat box. Uh, we are waiting for our friends to, to, to raise their hand. I just want to. <laughs> We're all still out in the field, maybe buzzing around. You didn't want to come back. It was so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say I really felt like a bee. I, um, it was amazing. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I think I had a glimpse into what a hive life is or would be thank and you what is, what is that glimpse daniela tell me about that glimpse i, I cannot really describe yet in the, the the experience not qualified it's just that um suddenly i for just maybe a microsecond um i i felt the buzz <laughs> of life mm -hmm. and um you know the the the, this, the 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 spread of perceptions coming from many 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 individuals yes yes thank you you're welcome so that sense of of not being alone of being <laughs> something bigger yeah yes mm -hmm. definitely yes um there is an 
that was uh, such a, a beautiful guided experience or a thank you yes so i'm good. just left with a bigger <laughs> more open heart feeling interconnected with all that is the very substance and texture of gaia ah <laughs> Yes. That was beautiful. Thank you. I'm so, so glad I had a pot of honey to mm. be able to taste and make that beautiful sound of appreciation. And I found mm. as I was being the bee going around that almost the mmm of om was naturally coming up as it felt like my wings were vibrating so thank you for a beautiful beautiful thing you're so welcome yay i'm seeing a bunch of things coming in through the chat here mm -hmm. um, the best Would part you like me? i i, yeah, I can see it i can read them the best okay. part was thank you daniela the best part was bringing the bee into my heart says chris and Risa said, I thought I heard the sound of bees. Um, what note is their sound? Um, there, I don't, I think that with honeybees, I don't know about all the other, you know, what, many thousands of bees, but the honeybees vibrate at a, a note of C, a C note, and that helps open certain flowers for them, is what I read about that. But the other bees, I don't know what their, their note is. But honeybees or bumblebees are, are, are a C. Yvette says, that was incredible. I did not feel alone, but supported. My senses were alive. I felt alive. Thank you. And Gillian said, I felt more peaceful and that I had received strength from the whole experience. Yes, yes, yes. So one of the things that's just buzzing through my brain right now is the sense of, of aloneness that I know that I've carried as a human being in this world, that I got plopped out into the world and I have community around me, but somehow I feel trapped within the confines of my own skin. And, but we're not alone, right? We are interconnected with each of each, each of us, all the humans, whether we agree with the human or not with the human, we're still all interconnected as one humanity, one species. And, we're interconnected with every single one of those bees of every kind that are out there helping the world to be. Um, and we are interconnected with every flower and tree and plant that is breathing with us in every moment. And what a gift that is, that we are not alone, trapped in the confines of our skin, but that we are deeply, deeply interconnected. Barclay says, dedication to the hive, to purpose, commitment to the hive, the group, many lessons for humanity to be in harmony with nature and the collective. Thank you, brilliant. So as an alchemical healer, one of the things we do is we work on the etheric level of healing. And, and so this, and we bring that into form, into physicality in a way. And so what we've done by all of us being the bees, the global bee, where our colony is like a, a global bee colony, and we've flown out to all the various flowers in all our various locations, and not just those of us who are here now live on this call, but anyone who is listening to this in the future time, you are part of this bee, global bee colony who has created this honey together. And we've now infused our honey with that medicine of all of those bees. So share your honey with your friends, with your neighbors, in whatever way you can during these crazy COVID times, um, because your, your honey is now medicine. Take a spoonful of it when you're feeling low or feeling ill. Put a dab of it if you burn yourself. Just a quick story. I was um, working on the slideshow the other night 
and I took a break from it and I went to cook dinner for my family and I had some oil in, in the pan and it was very hot, very, very hot. And the thing I was putting into the oil fell out of my hand and it splashed into the pan. And that splash of oil caught me in my chest and my armpit and then in my face and I was like oh my gosh there's oil in my face it really hurt bad um, and my instinct right that moment because I'd been working on the slideshow was like get the honey grab the honey <laughs> and so that's the first thing I did is I grabbed that honey and I put it on the spots on my face where the oil had hit which was like a mere fraction of <laughs> distance away from my eyeball so I'm glad it didn't get in my eyeball and I have there's barely any mark on my eye where the honey where I put the honey and where I got it around my lip barely any mark so use your honey it's medicine it's medicine so does anybody else have anything to share in terms of like one of the things that this idea of our collective right and this idea of our world today and the world we're living in and, and regardless of what country you're living in, we've all been touched by the recent events of this virus. Um, and how can we, when we're more separated than ever, how can we come together in this collective? How can we um, work as a hive, right? And not to take away our individuality, the beautiful uniqueness of who each of us are, but also how we can join together in, in greater community. Like, you know, I look at my garden and it's not a garden if it's only one crop, it's a monocrop then, right? It's only a garden if it has some of this and a little bit of that and something for this and something for that. So um, how, how do, I would love to hear from you about that. So Lynn says, I most appreciated the moment we sent out our heart communion to the world. Also, not just honeybees are pollinators, but many other kinds of bees do the work of pollinating. Yes, indeed. All, all the 20,000 varieties of bees are out there doing the work, as well as many, many, many others. My focus on honeybees had to do with the connection, though, for us to... to be able to taste that sweetness, feel that life pulse, you know, feel the divinity just as the um, in the ancient days, the, they would use the honey in the opening of the mouth ceremony to awaken the divinity within. Now each of us has been awakened to our own divinity within uh, in a new way. And how are we going to now go out and pollinate, <laughs> right? How are we going to pollinate? And what does that mean for each of us? Metaphorically pollinate the world with hope and goodness and care, right? Because I believe we all were put here to be caretakers for this beautiful planet, to help this beautiful planet be healthy and alive. So... Uh, hi. Hi. It's uh, Katja Kaufmann. Was, I just wanted to thank you. It is a deep experience. And um, I think I, for the first time, was introduced to the life of the bees when I was maybe 20 something years. And I accompanied my friend who wanted to become a beekeeper. Mm. And it was lectures at the university that we went to. And, uh, in the beginning, I thought, why would you need to lecture about that at the university? And then the more I was listening, the more I was completely like, taken aback. I thought it's, it's a civilization which is much more um, evolved than humans. Right. And um, I know that all the beekeepers and, uh, you know, he proceeded on that road. They it actually when they travel with their beehives, they sleep. They have the beehives around the quarters, living quarters, mm -hmm. on the move, and they sleep there. And they say absolutely, if you're sick, you don't even have to have the honey. You just if you sleep in between those hives, inside that little, uh, it's not a house but compartment rather, you get up, you know, healed. And uh, that is so true because the divine law in the higher law that they are part of, it is healing. Yes. So um, thank you. And 
now the last thought was biodiversity. As my uh, professor at the university used to say, he said, you know, we're a very small planet. <laughs> if it were at least like Jupiter, yes, but we are small and unique. So everything is unique. And in that uniqueness and diversity is our strength. Yes. And um, I think that bees, with their amazing unity, they aid that diver they create and nurture that diversity of life, of plant life, of etheric presences, because behind plants there are divas, right? And there are angelic presences. So that is uh, being united by that amazing little <laughs> angel, you know, yeah. doing this work. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have anything to add in to this conversation right now? Um, as we were mm, going through the visualization and listening to that sound of other bees in our hive, it was the 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 uh, realization came to me about the restoration of ancient mysteries and uh, in a way it's a coded truth that's expressed through certain symbols that's being sealed in the uh, certain stories and certain images and in a way certain um, what do you say this beings like bees yeah they i really appreciate you sharing their connection with the egyptian god mar is that the name right mat mahat Ma mahat the god of truth so they connected because they carry uh, they are an expression of archetypical law so they didn't step out of the law uh, in a way and if we uh, can read those symbols or we can recognize those principles manifested in this case through the bees uh, we can align with that archetypical principles and we can unseal those mysteries we can use those keys to open those principles in our lives and so that's why it's i think it's really important that we become sensitive to the stories behind those ancient mysteries ancient myths and legends but also through uh what we observe in nature because the truth is expressed through so many different presences as through the bees so in the ancient times the the name for the gods and goddesses of egypt it was nederu Nederu. Singular was a netter. Single god was a netter. Multiple gods were, or goddesses were, Nederu. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, as time passed uh, and Christianity came to root itself in the land of Egypt, the Coptic Christians, um, their word for God became Necher. Right, so the ancient Egyptians, it was Nederu, and then the Coptic Christians, they're even to this day, if you're in Egypt and you're in a Coptic church and they're praying, you hear them say Necher. Necher is, is their word for God. And now you can take the word Necher, and through time that word Necher becomes nature. And so it brings it back around again, right? Nature. And um, though this this short time we are together here, um, I've only dipped a little bit into that honey jar of the mysteries. Um, the the Nederu are nature, right? And so um, they're reflections of what the ancients recognized as divine in the nature natural world and how that um, reflection also lived within them, right? 
So each of those aspects, like Sekhmet is the fierce, compassionate one, we have that in us, you know, when something triggers your sense of right and wrong and you just get that enraged feeling, we've all had it, that's an aspect of Sekhmet. When we remember our heart and come back into balance, you know, that's that's part of that Sekhmet energy and each of, of the netter we can find within ourselves, right? And we can find within that greater whole. So thank you for bringing that forward super important and I mean we do whole whole weekends whole weeks <laughs> on the mysteries and all the various gods and goddesses because um, there are lots of them and, and they all bring different aspects to us and help us learn about ourselves not just as like oh yeah some mythology from way back when but in fact how I can arrive into my own living mythos of my lifetime and it's not about my mythos being recorded on some wall for some ancient person to come back to and read and oh hey this person Zahra blah 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 not so much that but how do I live within my own living mythos so that I am becoming who I'm meant to become on this planet who I'm meant to be right now so anyway yeah the mysteries help us with that and not just the ancient Egyptian mysteries but any of, of the esoteric um, wisdoms out there help bring us into deeper alignment with ourselves and with our place on the planet and with each other. So does anybody else have anything they want to share about what is? I have just a, a bit more informational stuff to share with you, but um, not too much more. So if anybody has anything else to add into the conversation, I would love to hear from you. I would like a, 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 to ask a question about the, um, this ritual of mouth of opening of the mouths because it seems to me we did it a little bit for ourselves. Yes. Well, we, <laughs> could you tell us a little bit more? About so, that? Yeah. Yeah. So the opening of the mouth ceremony. It's um, um, so when let me see. Let me pull my thoughts into cohesion. Because uh, they went to three different directions all at once. So let's say the carver had meticulously carved the statue, and the statue is now complete and it's ready to be placed in its place. Um, the ancients believed that the soul lived in the statue, that the statues were alive. And so um, the opening of the mouth ceremony would be used where the honey would be dipped into a special implement and that implement would be brought to the lips of the statue and in doing that with certain um, words of power and I can't tell you what those words of power are because I don't speak ancient Egyptian um, then that would imbue the statue with the soul with the life of the one that is represented in that statue and the same would be with uh the mummies when the um let's say the pharaoh had passed and he's mummified and they would do the opening of the mouth ceremony and bringing the honey to the mouth of the mummy in order to awaken the divinity within and help him transfer into um the field of reeds which is the 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 paradise or the afterlife in the ancient Egyptian time. I mean, there's a whole a whole process of that with the weighing of the heart and all this stuff that goes on. But in essence, the opening of the mouth is is that honey, that sweetness of life, that nectar of the sun, is what brings that divinity into the statue or into the mummy. Does that answer your question, Donya? Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> And so, yeah, in in a in a way, by each of us taking that honey into us to then bring us into the hive mind, into the hive experience, um, and then collecting the world flowers back to create this medicine, um, we brought some of that divinity into ourselves, right? And at the end, when we took the honey the second time, now that new honey was infused with all of the world from all the places that we're calling in from today and from all of the places that those who listen to this in the future are are coming from, right? And so in that, we've brought the world into ourselves. And when we bring the world into ourselves, we awaken our divinity even more, right? The more we're embodied on the planet, and open in the moment, the more we bring in the truth of, 
of divinity and that we are active co-creators on this planet and every choice and every action we make helps determine what the next moment will be. And when you times that on the collective scale of seven plus billion humans and you know all the bee kind and all the ant kind and wasp kind and four-legged and two-legged and feathered and scaled and swimming and all of all of the life and the rooted ones uh, that's a that's a lot of choices being made consciously and unconsciously so the honey helps wake us up to hopefully more and more conscious choices so that we truly can inhabit ourselves as humanity has the possibility to do what we could do if we all put our minds on it, it would be amazing. So uh, that's the the uh, last stanza of the great invocation. It's the the mantra and the prayer that we use in our work. It says that uh, from the center, which we call the human race, let the plan of love and light work out. So this the plan the restoration of the plan have to happen from the human kingdom it has to happen through us through the choices we make and through awakening that recognition of that archetypical substance and in a way honey it's that's like a symbol of that magical substance that awakens us so when we become awakened to the fact of the presence of, of, of the plan and we become the agents of the plan and it works through us and it works through humanity yes so it occurs to me that you know now that we all have these these infused potent jars of honey that um, whatever your practices are, right, whether it's a meditation or a prayer or whatever, however you have a, a ritual of a practice that we were talking about ritual in the beginning a little bit, um, you might be called to start that ritual with a little bit of honey and see what, what you notice. Um, see if it shifts how you go into that um, time of practice, of presence. So. Well, I wanted to just talk about the beloved, right? The, the, how can we love the bees? And there are, are many ways we can become aware to assist them and not just the honeybees. Of course, you know, I gave focus to honeybees here, but this is for all our pollinators. Um, so leaving out shallow water of dishes in shady spots near flowers on hot days, as someone suggested earlier in the chat, um, is really important. Uh, the little video I had, where is it? This one of all the bees coming. This is just a water pot I have, and they are very happy for that water pot. <laughs> um, uh, plant beneficial flowers and plants as appropriate to your biome and you know I, I think it's important to honor um, what's supposed to grow in a region versus what's been brought in so knowing what is appropriate for your growing area um, different flowers that bees like and there's many more than this of course but pansies and pussy willow peony bee balm lavender zinnias marigolds goldenrod chives mint sage nasturtiums black-eyed susans borage thyme oregano and many more um, don't use chemicals that can poisonate pollinators um, i'm not sure if i'm going to say these right i'm not very good at saying bing long names like this but the ones that contain neonicotinoids Nicotinoids. <laughs> and basically what that is, it's a, a nicotine derivative and it, it really disrupts the bee's ability to, to function in the world and it, it hurts them really bad. And they show up, that compound shows up in different um, names like thymine thoxam, I don't know if I'm saying that right, and clothiadin, something like that. Anyway, you can read them on the screen. Um, so look for things that don't contain those and ideally organic, 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 and even biodynamic um, are really beneficial for our world, our ground, our bees, for all of us. Um, Purchasing honey that is raw and local when possible. A lot of the processed honey that is in stores often contains corn syrup, and so it's not even really honey. 
So raw local honey, and then you're sure to get the benefit of the flowers of your biome and your growing region, uh, which can be really beneficial for people who have allergies. Sorry, my computer's stinging at us. Um, eating honey in the allergy season can help you with that because you're getting some of the pollen essence from that. And so in a homeopathic way, it helps your body fight that while you're going through the allergy season. And then when you use honey, I just really invite you to bring to mind everything it takes for the flowers and the bees to make that small jar of honey for you knowing how many flowers you know what two million go into a pound of honey that's a lot of flowers that's a lot of flowers and a lot of bees to fly for us and do this tireless work that they just do because that's what they're supposed to do no one's paying them and we um have taken advantage of their endless work um, and also given their greater opportunity with all of our flowers that we offer them so anyway um that's that's that so be loved love the bees and feel loved and feel connected to each other and um to your families and to this world because you know the better we care for each other the the more more love we can spread around so unless there's anything else i think we are almost to our time um, I just want to get up on the screen real quick, the references of various places I pulled either pictures or information or any of that. So honor to everywhere that didn't come out of my own brain or heart. And um, finally, gratitude, just big gratitude to the 2025 initiative for inviting me to be here with you today and to each of you for um, showing up and paying attention with me. And, and especially to all the bees that helped create all the honey that we all got to enjoy and for their tireless work on the planet. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, Donya and Egypt. If it wasn't for Egypt, I wouldn't have met Donya and, or Doniela and Daniela. If I hadn't met you, I wouldn't be here today. So big gratitude. Thank you. Round. <laughs> yes, thank and you so just, much. And um, we've all lit a candle, or those who have lit the candle, why don't we bring that candle up and um, take a deep breath into our heart center and feel that mmm that we felt when we had the honey in our mouth. And when you're ready, just put the fire to sleep, knowing that when this candle is lit again, it is bringing with it all this sweet goodness that we've shared in this last hour and a half. Thank you so much. <laughs> My dog Daisy says thank you very much and <laughs> it comes with gratitude from all the uh, animals and all the plants and all the sentient beings uh, from all of us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be well, everybody. Be well. <laughs> and uh, thanks everyone who joined us today. And uh, today is the second day of the five days period of the full moon. We uh, continue our work, and tomorrow is the exact time of the full moon. It's a day of silence. So as we meditate, please let be. connected and subjectively staying together as one group and um, on the fourth and the fifth day of the full moon there will be a special program and uh, let me show my screen just to sh make some announcements um, uh, here it is. Um, so this Leo full moon is a special time and this is the festival of Leo and Sirius and it's the first Leo festival in the seven years cycle and uh, BK said that in the new world religion the Leo festival will be um, one of the most important ones for 
celebrating the mysteries and for restoration of the mysteries. So it's important that we meditate together this full moon and we together with the Moria Federation and the Blue Rose Sisterhood prepare the program for to reflect together on creation of the new mysteries, emerging mysteries. And that program would be on August 4th at 1 p.m. GMT. Please note it's unusual time for our broadcast. Um, so it will be opportunity for us to share and reflect together. And on August 5th, we invite you at 1 p.m. to come for closing day meditation and ritual. And there will be a candle lighting ceremony and each group participating will have a chance to name itself and voice the synthetic note that your group precipitated during this full moon. So check in our announcements, there is a, a special registration form for that. And also this full moon, we start the new creative lab on awakening the souls of our nations. That would be on August 4th at 6 p.m. Please join us. And that creative lab is focalized by the, uh, as they call themselves, groups of Jews and Germans. So please join us on August 6th, on August 4th, sorry. And um, also at this cycle of Leo, at the new moon, we will Hold, we will hold the open forum for us together to meditate and reflect on continuing our work through the new moon cycles as we finished with the third cycle of meditation on sustainable development goals. And also at the new moon, there will be yet another creative lab on translating the essence of ageless wisdom. So stay tuned and thank you. Alexander, do you want me to push the magic?